Hello everybody, this is the second part of our Going Further Than Hadoop presentation. And in this part, we just tell you how to use Apache Storm and Heron. These are the big data software systems which allow you to do streaming data, flowing data, all your teddy bears sending their remarks back to the cloud, all your cars asking about the how to get from A to B, or your smartphones asking cosmic questions. So streaming data, actually a major use commercially is probably advertising. Every time you click on a page, then a click is streamed. And you know, the significance of that click is uh, analyzed and they find the best possible way of extracting money from you. The high point of computer science research these days. All right, so we're going to look at Storm and Heron. Heron is a successor to Storm. Both came from Twitter. They have similar architecture. Heron supports the API of Storm, it just runs faster. And here we have that nice, pretty um, um, Apache uh, flags, flagpoles. And uh, let's go. All right, so here's some general remarks about streaming. And um, it is probably true the majority of applications. So this is not an exception. The majority are streaming. Um, they're not always treated as streaming. They sometimes streaming data is accumulated and only processed every now and then. You only get a bank statement every month, even though probably the data when you spend your credit card is streamed from where you do the do you flash out your card to um, the, that data stream from the card processing uh, device of the cashier back to bank headquarters. Now it's worth noticing some sort of trivial numbers. Um, video conferencing is well known that uh, 30 frames per second is a sort of typical high quality video, which then uh, dividing 1 30th, you get 30, 33 milliseconds as a typical interval. Actually, um, MPEG, the, the uh, protocol actually sends multiple messages in that 30 milliseconds. But anyway, it's roughly one unit of information every 30 milliseconds. And that tells you what users can tolerate. Now, the users don't find much happen. I mean, if you do everything with 30 frames a second, there is no flicker or annoyance. Uh, the other thing, which is the overall latency, is more like hundreds of milliseconds, which is that how how fast will the users tolerate a delay? If you ask a question of somebody in the cloud center, how long do they have to get an answer? Like search engines, when you type a search, find all all um, universities catering to hippopotami, the response to that search question needs to come back in a couple of hundred milliseconds or you will get annoyed. Um, Hadoop is a batch system. It just takes accumulated data and runs it through a system. And uh, when the end of the data set it comes, you finish to your Hadoop. But Storm and Heron are not like that. They just run forever. An event comes along and it lasts a finite amount of time in Storm and Heron. But the Storm and Heron themselves run forever. You sometimes have windows, like 30 minutes, and then you look at the data in the last 30 minutes or something like that to get the most timely information. But that's your choice. And typically, streaming systems support some sort of windowing. Another key feature of streaming data is that you, you don't necessarily keep the data. Sometimes you do, actually, like with Twitter, you secretly save the tweets as well as processing them in real time. However, there is a whole set of algorithms called online algorithms or streaming algorithms. And they actually assume they only see each data point once. So they have to extract the maximum out of it. Because they can't go back and keep piling it in. If you go to classic deep learning, it goes back and back to the, uh, to the uh, training data and gets a little bit more oomph from, each, from it each time. So when I was actually doing this PowerPoint, it appeared that uh, you can look up online and see what happened. 
and there were 8,390 tweets appeared in the second that I was writing this page. That sort of a, again, gives you the size of what's going on. Twitter has to process over 8,000 a It actually is worse, because sometimes it gets more than 8,000. Here's actually um, 2013, when it actually found over almost 100 and 44,000 tweets occurred in one second discussing a movie. I don't think the movie was anything very special, but obviously it caused a lot of interest among the Japanese viewers. And this is the record for tweets per second. So your system has to be able to cope with these Mother Day events when there's unusual activity. So your storm on your heron must be able to cope. They do that by queuing the, queuing the data. At least that's a simple way of doing it. It does actually mean there's a delay that when your 120, 40,000 tweets come, they're not going to be treated with the same alacrity. But they're not going to be lost. That's because they're buffered on queuing devices, which is where Apache Kafka and RabbitMQ and ActiveMQ come in. Those queue events and allow you to, to absorb such an increase in intensity. Um, so we need uh, to look at both the 30 millisecond, which is the time um, the human brain doesn't notice too much, and also the latency in processing an event, which as I already mentioned in these slides, when you have a robot or a self-driving car, or you're monitoring for the, the ballistic missile, which is about to destroy the world, Oh, you may have to just respond very quickly, and you may not be able to afford to send it back to the cloud. Because a cloud, there's going to be at least a 200 millisecond delay by the time you travel there, travel back, and do something on the cloud. Um, and so Storm and Heron are designed for this case where they're not doing real time, because this is being done on the cloud. It's not being done locally on your on your tweeting uh, phone. And it actually is, is trying to get results back in a few hundred milliseconds. So you say, uh, these all come from Twitter. They're much more apl generally applicable than Twitter. And they, their capabilities, which are now well understood, because they're open source. Because Twitter open source, Storm and Heron, we're able to look at them and see how they're designed, which is, and we'll show some of those features later on here. So Apache Storm is the cosmic system. I say Heron has really not changed a lot, just just uh, cleaned up and improved. It's written in Clojure, which is a Lisp to Java uh, system, and it um, exposes a coarse-grained data flow model. Um, and it is doing real-time analytics, online machine learning, distributed or remote procedure calls. It is fault tolerant. It has guarantees in its messaging, and it's scalable to very large systems. And there is a project called Trident, which is on top of Storm, which has various uh, cosmic operations, which we'll actually see in, in Spark, such as joins and filters and things like that. And Trident is guaranteed not to use messages more than once. Notice all these systems are very, very sensitive to faults and delays, because you've got to be certain that you process things just once. So, if, and you mustn't process it twice. And yet, if things go in a concurrent fashion to multiple servers, it can get pretty, pretty confusing to see that the particular event only goes to one server. If it goes to two servers, it only gets processed from one, and things like that. <coughs> so there are actually other open source systems, S4 from Yahoo, and SAMSA from LinkedIn, which have similar problems to Twitter uh, uh, in the real world. And um, there are also Apache open source. There's some commercial systems, Millwheel from Google. The most well-known is Kinesis from Amazon, and Stream Analytics from Mozilla Microsoft. Those are the major commercial streaming systems. 
And like Storm, it says, has been used by 84 companies, which they list. And uh, they some quite large companies here, Alibaba, Baidu, Groupon, Yahoo, Yelp, Spotify, and so on. Uh, the Weather Channel uses um, Storm to persist web, to process weather data. And they have different Storm so-called topologies. Those are collections of processing units which um, uh, process particular data sets which have special features. And it had the fault tolerance and guarantees in Storm allows you to break. I mean, if you even see this trivial thing, if you start using these online cloud systems, it's pretty hard uh, to get things to be guaranteed right. Because if the system crashes, who restarts it? In systems like Storm, all that restart stuff is handled correctly. All right, we actually have done, with my students Supan and I, have done a lot of work in this area. We uh, designed a system called IoT Cloud, which was a license to a company in Canada. Um, mainly, I think, to impress their, inven their investors, not because they wanted to use it specially. And it had the following features. We have the Edge devices, which have various gateways, such as to, which basically convert the robot operating system, uh, which they all tend to run to the publish subscribe environment. They send messages by publish subscribe, which we'll discuss, uh, which is Apache Kafka or ActiveMQ. And so they end here on this publish subscribe system. Storm links only links to this part. And Storm is running um, all sorts of distributed and batch algorithms. It's running batch because it can, it can persist the messages to cloud storage like um, no SQL or HDFS file systems, and those can run batch processing like Iterative MapReduce on it. Here's a list of some published subscribe systems, and they all have and the basic idea is you publish a message. When you click your smartphone, you're publishing a message. Those messages go to queues, and those queues are labeled like from Fred. Something to do with sports, teddy bear, or whatever, you know, they have labels which are um, implied by the source of the messaging or the content of the message. And then subscribers, though the Kafka and the RabbitMQ, et cetera, put these messages in queues. <coughs> they basically guarantee the messages are processed correctly and are once in a once in the only once fashion. Subscribers choose a subset of messages. They look for all messages on sports from Fred. And they have a sort of, they do that. And then they, the subscribers, which in the case of Storm is uh, the continuously running Storm event processor, then processes the messages appropriately. Remember the weather panel had, um, Different storm installations, which are effective for different topics. Um, so the message: there are many such PubSat systems. We built one with my student uh, Shradeep Palarikar many uh, almost 20 years ago, called the Narada Brokering. But now there are very high-quality published uh, open-source projects. Kafka came from LinkedIn. That is how many of these systems come from a commercial company. Um, RabbitMQ is a famous one, which probably preceded Kafka. Java Message Service is a well-known, it's not a system, it's an API, which allows Java programs to work with published subscribe systems. Most of these systems will support the JMS API. ActiveMQ is a open source JMS API. ZeroMQ doesn't have brokers, just uses peer-to-peer -to, -peer to send the messages directly from publishers to subscribers. Kestrel is a distributed message queue. And the famous, famous and historic is MQ series from IBM, who sort of invented PubSub. And it is very old and very famous. And probably not used except by IBM, who probably put it in lots of products. Thrift was also used in um, Storm and uh, 
and it actually used for building messages. I showed you how important messages are, because you're sending data from the edge to the cloud, and that's got to go in a message. And um, Thrift is an interface definition language, effectively tells you how the messaging is uh, implemented, uh, the protocol it uses, and the API. And um, Storm uses it for its internal communication and data definition. And there's a thing called a struct in Thrift, which is what a Storm topology is, which is a data flow graph. Storm Nimbus, which is a, a Thrift service, which is actually the controller for running a topology. <coughs> and there are other approaches to, to this interface problem. Protocol buffers, which is from Google, but open source is not Apache. And that is used by Heron. Twister 2 actually doesn't use any of them because they have performance problems, which we don't like. So we have tuples and streams. The basic unit of information is a tuple, which is a named list of values, where each value can be of any type. And you can do that dynamically. And these tuples have helper methods like get integer and get string to get, to get the field values without actually knowing how it is stored. And everything has to be serialized. Whenever you're sending messages, you have to serialize it because the internal storage of information in a computer depends on that computer. You'll have probably be different in ARM computers and Intel and so on. And so you serialize, which means you cast it into a form on the message, which can be recognized by all possible computers. So you must serialize when you put it into a message. Um, and tuples are an ordered set of elements, like here's a, a string, an integer, and here's an object defining a point. And that's a tuple, this collection. And the stream is just a set of tuples, one tuple after another. And it goes on forever, tupling away. So as you click your, click your web page, uh, Google makes up a tuple describing what you did, and it whips that tuple off to the uh, storm and instantiation or kinesis instantiation that is processing that data. Um, next concepts are spouts. So a spout is a source of data. So your Kafka feeds data to a spout. The spout is, the, is then the set of tuples, and those spouts go into the processing. And the processing uh, is actually a bolt. A bolt is the same as a map. In MapReduce, it's just called bolts for because it comes from uh, Twitter, not from Google. And, uh, but it's essentially identical to a map, or maybe also to a data flow node. Um, in, in Storm, data flow nodes and maps are rather similar. Um, so here is the overall architecture. You have some controller, which is Nimbus, which I told you comes from uh, Thrift. The user invokes Nimbus. There is Zookeeper, which is coping with all this uh, concurrency, because there's lots of concurrency issues with Storm, because there is multiple Storm to scale, because the stream may have, remember we have 100, 44,000 tweets a second going down to a few thousand. So we may have to scale uh, scale the uh, storm installation by uh, between these different uh, sizes of tweets per second. Um, so we have supervisors in the nodes, and uh, the zookeeper is just keeping all these things coordinated given the concurrency will, will otherwise lead to inconsistent answers. Um, so here we have the reason, here we can see why we call them spouts. Uh, the stream is like dripping water. Uh, the bolt is, um, uh, well, it's an electrical, um, it's represented here by an electrical event, uh, doing something dramatic to the, to, to the water. And they say spouts can be re bolts can be replicated to increase processing power. As can spouts be. Um, so here we have a typical 
data flow topology, bolts arranged in a data flow graph, and spouts at the beginning of the graph. Uh, there is a Apache system called Cara, which is serializing, and Netty, which transfers the messages internally to Storm. Here is what we did. Um, we had drones and Tuttlebots and tweets. We sent them all to RabbitMQ, because at least when we did our work, which is now a few years ago, about three or four years ago, uh, RabbitMQ had better performance than Kafka. We'll see some graphs which show that. And um, this, um, these queues here in the cloud, this is Apache Storm. Processing with topologies, these are the topologies. Uh, with, so these are bolts here, bolt, 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 bolt. And these things here are the spouts uh, coming from the publish subscribe, and here we're driving it with a toggle bot or a drone. And of course, the cloud can be controlled by Kubernetes. Uh, so here is a more particular example of how it was done. With um, RabbitMQ, we have lots of edge sensors with gateways basically converting the edge data into a form acceptable to Kafka, well, in this case, RabbitMQ. RabbitMQ sends the data to the bolts, which then get processed, the spouts, which they've processed. And bolts send the data back. So here we have. Processing ending up in final bolts, which send the data back again through RabbitMQ. So these things are both each of the both the edge and the cloud are both publishers and subscribers. That's what's needed for real-time feedback and control. Now these are typical performance numbers you get. Here we have latency, um, and here we have. The type I mentioned, hundreds of milliseconds. So here we have 50 milliseconds, and uh, these are not doing much work on the on the events. And if you have small messages, then the, the system can easily handle it. If the messages are bigger and bigger, unless you scale the, the brokers up, which we didn't, then you suddenly the processing time gets becomes infinite because there's just not enough time to process all the data. But here, in this sort of rational operating environment, everything is running very smoothly. The Kafka, which where we notice the scale is larger, this is 250, here it was 100. Uh, we had more trouble in getting it to work properly, because Kafka just at that time had more overhead. So that just says you need to work carefully on these systems to get them to run properly. Here we change the number of devices with RabbitMQ again. Too many devices produce too many messages, which cause the system to crash. And Kafka is much worse than, than RabbitMQ. Here we have tens of milliseconds. Here we have thousands of milliseconds. All right. And this here is the last slide. And this is for RabbitMQ operational with a toggle bot. The latency, this is not really. This is a little cheating in that the cloud is very near the, the device because the cloud is at Indiana and the device is at Indiana University. So this is just mentioned, <coughs> this is just the processing time in Storm and, and Kafka and also the gateways. And you notice that um, there are a few issues here with, latent, with uh, excessive latency. Almost everything produces latency. Your cloud can be asleep. You can have a garbage collection in Java, and so on. But you can see, and these have to be controlled, because if we're doing real time, we somehow must be able to control that these um, spikes do not happen, or they are limited to a latency which is acceptable. Maybe 50 is acceptable. 